Amen. We're there in John chapter 4. We're going to uh, get a couple verses in uh, from where we were. Um, we're going to do some soul winning tips tonight, all right? So we're going to look at um, Jesus' conversation again with the Samaritan woman. So last week, we got up to verse number uh, about 25, about verse number 24, where basically Jesus is having this conversation um, with this uh, woman of Samaria. We talked about how the Jews and the Samaritans were, were divided people, where the Jews were, you know, they were basically racist against the Samaritans, and they didn't like them, they didn't feel that they were, were Jews. But it's interesting because we see that this woman um, is basically believing like the Jews, um, she, only, she only is disagreeing with the place to worship, um, really, um, and Jesus kind of sets her straight on that. Um, we looked at that um, last week. This week, we're going to start in verse number 25, where Jesus continues the conversation. So remember, last week, Jesus tells her that, you know, the mountain or the Jerusalem doesn't matter. It's spirit and truth that matters. You need to be worshiping the Lord in spirit, meaning, a, you know, you can do that anywhere. And then, of course, you need to be worshiping the Lord in truth. You need to be worshiping the one true God. You need to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, so Jesus continues this conversation with this woman after explaining this to her. In verse number 25, the Bible says this. We're going to look at some soul winning tips from this conversation this evening. So hopefully um, we can, you know, sharpen your soul winning skills tonight. All right. Look at verse number 25 where the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. So again, it's interesting that she's a Samaritan, yet she's looking for the Messiah just like the Jews are. So it's this interesting situation where this woman gets saved and, you know, she's not even a Jew. So this is kind of the first Gentile that we see, you know, the gospel going out to when Jesus is in his ministry here. And she says, I know the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. And then look at verse number 26, which is as far as we're going to get tonight, all right, where Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So basically, Jesus just tells her right there. She says, I know that the Christ is coming. I know the Messiah is coming. You know, she's, she's believing the, the coming Messiah, just like the Jews believe or, you know, claim to believe. And she is saying, um, you know, I know that there's, a, there's God sending a Savior. And he basically just tells her, it's me. And that's his, I mean, it's like the quickest soul winning presentation you'll ever see right there. All right. Jesus is just basically saying, you know, I'm the Messiah. That's it. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, will take this and be like, well, you only need to explain things to people, you know, the things that they don't know when you're out soul winning. Well, the culture of our church, before I even get into the, um, into the sermon this evening, you know, let me just say that, you know, yes, this is Jesus giving a pretty quick soul winning presentation here. He did, you know, make her aware of her sin is the same as we would out soul winning. So she knows that she's a sinner in need of a Messiah. And then he just tells her, I'm the Messiah. And of course, Jesus hasn't died on the cross yet. But like I said, it's a pretty quick soul winning presentation. He doesn't do a lot of explaining about hell. He doesn't do a lot of explaining about the gift. He doesn't do a lot of explaining about eternal security. He just tells her, I'm the Messiah, and that's the end of it. And it really just becomes a question for this lady whether or not, you know, he's the Christ. And I believe she believes that he's the Christ as she goes and tells everybody in town. All right? So the point is, is the culture of our church is that we never give partial soul winning presentations. One of the things that churches that don't go soul winning, even churches that have the right gospel that don't go soul winning, one of the big criticisms that they will, you know, it's a, it's a false criticism, but one of the criticisms that they will level against a church like ours is, oh, you're, you're one, two, three, pray after me. You're, you're, you're just going out there and saying a prayer with somebody. It's like, no, we are thorough soul winners. We go out and we preach the entire gospel. Well, what if somebody knows who Jesus is? What if somebody knows this and knows that, and they tell me that, oh, I grew up Catholic, or I grew up in Sunday school, or I grew up whatever. We're going to preach the whole gospel to that person regardless. It's one thing if we know someone's not going to listen and you want to give somebody some teasers and just kind of tell them, hey, it's not of works, it's a gift. And, you know, we all do this just to kind of spark their interest to get them to watch the video later on. But if somebody wants you to open the Bible to them, we are going to preach the whole gospel to them. You say, well, why? Jesus didn't. Well, you're not Jesus. That's why. You don't know what people believe and don't believe. 
You don't know if you get to, you know, hell and people are just like, yeah, I don't think I deserve hell. You know, there's a lot of people like that. There's a lot of people where, you know, they'll tell you they're a sinner. They'll tell you that they know they're not perfect. Look, 99.9% .9 of people out there know that they're, not, they're a sinner. But then you will find people that, you know, because they've been poisoned by so much of this prosperity gospel and God is only love and would never send anybody to hell and they've, they've been poisoned by these liberal churches with this fake version of God, there's a lot of people out there that think that not that I, I, I don't deserve hell. I think I'm pretty good. Yes, I sin, but I think I'm pretty good. That's just one example. We are not Jesus. We are not God. We don't know what people don't believe. We don't know what people's hang-ups are. That's why we will go through the whole thing. We are not, you know, one, two, three, pray after me. Look, I believe in easy believism because it's easy to believe. But we are thorough gospel preachers here. We're going to go out and give the whole gospel. We are not Jesus. We are not God. All right, so that's the first thing before we even get into it. But it's interesting in verse number 26 that Jesus just comes out. Jesus just comes out and he says, look, let me just get, go back to that point for just a second. It is a damaging thing to pray with somebody that's not saved. Think about that. Think about that. How many people have you met out soul winning? And look, I'm not saying that you are not going, that, that every single person you pray with is truly, you know, believing. There's no way you could know that. But what you can do, what you can control on your side is thoroughly preaching the gospel and then reviewing those points every single time you give the gospel. Instead of just giving some half version or some, oh, somebody only has three minutes or somebody only has four minutes, point them to the video. It'd be better for them to, you know, watch a video and, and take the time to think about it themselves than for you just to slam the gospel in their face in two minutes and then say some quick prayer with them when they're not saved. That's a damaging thing. Yeah. You'll meet people out there that literally won't want to listen to the gospel because they prayed with somebody before. Because they said some prayer with a Pentecostal pastor. No, 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 I've already done that. I've already done that. Because they think it's all about the prayer, not the belief. They're believing wrong. They've never believed on or trusted in Jesus, but they've said a prayer before. So that's not going to be us. We don't want to confuse people. We're not about confusion. We're about the truth. Amen. So it's a super important thing that we are very thorough every single time. And look, if I know I'm talking to somebody that, has, that probably just has one hang-up, like maybe they're one hang-up, maybe they know all this stuff, and they have one hang-up on eternal security, or one work of baptism, or one work of you know, not blaspheming the Holy Ghost or one work of, they, they just have one tiny little hang up. I still go through the whole thing and I'll just, pre I'll just preface the conversation by saying, hey, most of this I'm sure you're familiar with, but I'm going to point out where the Bible says something different from what you told me. So I'll just say like, you're probably going to, I'm sure you've heard a lot of this before. And you know what? They probably haven't. Because the vast majority of people have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. It is such a sad thing to say that. I mean, that's why you'll see so many people out there soul winning that say to you, I've just never heard somebody explain it to me like that before. And what are you doing? You're just explaining what the Bible says. It's very, it's the simplicity of Christ. That's it. That's all we are doing. So all that to say this. We're going to be thorough every single time. There's no half presentations of the gospel. We're going to be thorough. We're going to review. And then when people tell us they believe the things that we reviewed with them, then we're going to help them call upon the name of the Lord. That's how you do it. All right. Now look at verse 26. I want to address uh, a, a specific thing tonight and then kind of show you some more soul winning tips after I address this specific thing. But look at verse 26 where this is probably, it's hard to say, but I think it's one of the most direct statements that Jesus gives that he is the Christ that he is the Messiah, where he says, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So Jesus is literally selling, this lady said, I know the Messiah comes, I know Christ is coming, and Jesus says, it's me, I that speak unto thee am he. Who's he talking about? He, the Messiah, the Christ. There's an argument out there that I've heard so many times that I'm getting sick of hearing it, that Jesus never claimed to be God. 
If you're a soul winner, you've heard somebody bring this up to you before. Jesus never claimed to be God. There's really three different, um, three different versions of this one, okay? Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. And Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. People will tell you this. I mean, you'll meet people at the door. You'll meet people in your life. And they'll find out you're a Christian. They'll find out you, you trust in Jesus. You're a believer. And they're just like, you know that Jesus never claimed to be God? Which is the most naive, one of the most naive statements you could ever make. So let me just quick give you a couple verses on each one of these so you can have them in your arsenal. Um, not that it's going to matter. I'm going to explain that to you after this. But look at John chapter 10 just show, to show you. And it's funny because people that say this, they come at you with kind of like this intellectual, like they're looking down their nose at you. Like, you know, did you know? Yeah, yeah, I know. Like, I know you've never opened up the Bible once in your life and read a single word of it. That's what I know. By a, by a comment like that, look at John chapter 10. Look at verse number 27 for context. Jesus is speaking, and Jesus says, I'm just going to go to Jesus' words first, okay? Jesus is speaking, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's a great eternal security verse right there. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And then look at this, verse 30. I and my Father are one. He just equates himself with God right there. And look, here's another thing you need to understand about these verses where Jesus literally claims the status of God, he claims to be God, is no one at the time misunderstood these things. Everybody understood exactly what Jesus was saying. Look at the next verse. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Why did they do that? Because they didn't like, they didn't like how he looked or they didn't like who his friends were? No, because he just claimed to be God. That's why they took up stones to stone. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. There's the Son of God. For which of those works do ye stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Blasphemy because he's claiming to be God, and they literally list it here. And because that thou being a man, makest thyself God. Nobody, under, nobody misunderstood what Jesus was talking about here. Turn to John chapter 8. Turn to John chapter 8. I love this one. But I mean, that's pretty direct. Jesus claims to be God. They try to kill him. And then they tell him why they're trying to kill him is because he claimed to be God. So this idea that Jesus never claimed to be God, it, I mean... What can you say? Look at John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Turn to Exodus chapter 3. So he says, Jesus actually, see, Jesus, Jesus never came out and said in, in stupid American English, I am God. He said it in these clever, interesting ways like this. And Look at, he said it in two ways right here. You're going to Exodus chapter 3, but the first thing he said here is before Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. So he literally says there, he's claiming to be God in two ways. Number one, I was before Abraham. How are you going to be before Abraham if you're not God? He's saying, I always existed. And again, they understood exactly what he was claiming here. But then he says this, these, these words, I am. What's he talking about? Look at Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, he calls himself I am. What does I am mean? And God said unto Moses, I am that, what? I am. God literally equates his name with I am. So I am is God. And Jesus is saying, I am that I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is literally saying in a, in a super scriptural way that I am God. In John chapter 8. And he says, I am hath sent me unto you. So one of God's names in the Old Testament is I am. Turn to John chapter 10. How about this? Jesus being the Son of God. Did Jesus ever directly claim to be the Son of God? Did you know that Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God? Turn to John chapter 10 again. John chapter 10. Let's just keep reading a few verses here. John chapter 10, look at verse 36 now. It says, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest. So they just called Jesus 
a blasphemer for claiming to be God, and then Jesus then says, you know, you know, thou blasphemest because I said I am the Son of God. So there he calls himself, so he equated himself with the Father, and then he also says, I am the Son of God. Turn to John 3.16. Do you have to turn to John 3.16? But here's what people forget. The most famous verse in the Bible is Jesus claiming to be the Son of God. Did you know that? <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because everybody knows John 3.16. Even people that don't know the Bible, you know, have heard, you know, John 3.16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And people don't realize that, you know, that's Jesus saying that. Those are red words in your red-letter Bible. I mean, it's for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus, again, saying that he is the son of God. Turn to Luke chapter 1. Actually, you turn to John chapter 5, and I'll read for you Luke chapter 1, verse number 35. Even Mary directly knew this. Even Mary directly knew that Jesus was the son of God. Look at this. The angel answered. You're going to John 5. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost hath come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. John 5, 18. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought more to kill him. Because he said what? He said God was his father. He's claiming to be the Son of God. Because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but also that God was his father. Again, making himself equal with God. They knew what he was saying. Nobody was under, misunderstanding this. How about this? Jesus being the Messiah, the Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Of course, we have the very direct statement in John chapter 4 and verse number 26 that we just looked at. But look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, look at verse number 4. This is a pretty direct one right here. We're talking about end times prophecy here. Jesus is talking to the disciples about things to look for in the end times. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name. What is my name? Saying what? I am Christ and shall deceive many. Jesus is just saying many people are going to come saying they're the Christ, but I am the Christ. Look, even turn to John chapter 20. Turn to John chapter 20. Even the devils knew that Jesus was God, that he was the Son of God. In Luke 4.41, the devils also came out of many crying and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. Jesus didn't want people to know yet. So he was refusing to let them speak because the devils knew that he was Christ. Look at John, uh, where to have you go? John 20? Look at John chapter 20 and verse number 28. So the Bible said, now I'm showing you just cases where Jesus himself didn't say it, but the Bible is just telling you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he's God. Look at John 20, 28. That, or look at verse 27. Then saith he to Thomas, reach, Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And of course, did Jesus rebuke him for that? No, he didn't. Because he is God. The rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. This was a kind of a clever way. Uh, a lot of people will use this. Actually, why don't you turn there? Turn to Mark chapter 10. A lot of people will use this one to say, See, Jesus isn't God. When he was actually saying, I am God. In Mark chapter 10. But you kind of have, you know, you got to be, you know, Smarter than a fifth grader to, to, to see the versions like this. He did directly say it, as I showed you in, you know, six, seven, eight, nine verses. I could have showed you um, dozens of verses like that. Look at Mark chapter 10 and verse 17. And when he was gone forth in the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. He didn't say that I'm not good. He said that you called me good, and there's only one good, that is God. And he's basically saying, you were right. He's like, how did you know? <laughs> how did you know? He's like, there's only one good, that is God. And Jesus equates himself to God so many other times in the Bible. Jesus is literally saying, I am God, I am good. And he's kind of pointing out 
that this kid came up and called him good, and he's like, do you know that I'm God? That's what he's saying to this kid, right? It's kind of a clever way. But like, all these verses, all these verses that I just read to you, I'm just trying to point out a certain type of person that you're going to run into. Not necessarily just this question, but I showed you all these clear verses from the Bible. Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God, when in reality, he personally claimed it many, many times in the Bible. And number two, the Bible itself claims it many, many times on all three of those titles. And even on top of that, folks, his works proved it. His works proved it as he's raising people from the dead, as he is healing the blind, healing the sick, healing the lame. That's literally why the woman at the well believed he was the Christ. Why? Because he told her all the things that I had ever done. Because he m mysteriously came up and told her about her husband's situation. And that's what she goes and tells the people in the town. She's like, is this not the Christ? Because he did this great miracle. So not only did he say it many times, not only did he, did he, uh, does the Bible claim it many times, say it many times, but his works proved it over and over and over again. And guess what? Turn to Matthew chapter 26. Turn to Matthew chapter 26. His death proves it. His death, you say his death? Yes, his death, the reason he was killed, proves that he claimed to be God. That is why he was killed. Very similar to John 10, 28, 29, 30, and 31, the literal reason that the Jews pressured the Romans into killing Jesus was because he claimed to be God. Look at verse number uh, 64 of Matthew chapter 26. Jesus saith unto him, actually go back to verse 63. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. He's like, Exactly. You said it. Amen. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. That's a pretty direct, yeah, I, I am God. I am the Son of God. You said it yourself. Then the, and maybe the high priest misunderstood him. The high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need we of witness? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. So they're going to you know, try to railroad him in this trial somehow, and they're like, he just blasphemed himself by calling himself the Son of God. They knew exactly what he was claiming. Nobody was confused about this except some person that thinks they know about the Bible today. Nobody in Bible times was confused that Jesus was claiming that he was God. Every single page of the Gospels proves at some point, in some way, that Jesus was God. You say, okay, Pastor, you're really driving this home here. He's like, you're like, I get it. I believe that Jesus is God. But the point I want you to get, and the irony, and kind of the soul-winning tip that's going to come out of this tonight, is that if you take that person that says, did you know that Jesus never claimed to be God, and you show them the 30 verses that we just went through, this in-depth, and look, we could have went to 30 more, and 30 more, and 30 more, and 30 more. If you show them all those verses, they will not believe it. That's, that, that's the irony. Even if you show it to them from the Bible, they're literally claiming, think about this, they're literally claiming that the Bible doesn't say something. And then you will show them, turn to Titus chapter 3, then you will take the Bible and you will show them that the Bible does say something and they won't believe it. It doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, it's not logical that somebody would act that way. Not if it was an honest question at the beginning. Because if it was an honest question and they were just, they were just misunderstanding something, this would never happen in, in, in real life in some other situation, whether you be at work or whatever. If you're at work and somebody says, no, 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 that handle on the machine goes on the left side. The left side. And, and you say, no, 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 look, here's the manual. It says put it on the right side. 
any normal person would be like, oh, okay. They wouldn't just say, no, the, the steering wheel goes in the trunk or whatever. I mean, it, it's, it's an odd thing. It's an odd thing. But I'm telling you that they will not believe it no matter how many verses you show them. The people that ask that type of question. Turn to Titus chapter 3. Are you there? Look at verse number 10 of Titus chapter number 3. The Bible gives us some protection against this type of person. All right? Look at verse number 10. It says, A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing, knowing that he is such that is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So this is the type of person that he's... It, it, how do I know? First of all, what's a heretic? What's a heretic? Okay, heretic is somebody, if you look up like the dictionary definition of a heretic, it's going to say like somebody whose beliefs are not considered, somebody whose beliefs are considered wrong. But if you look at, I mean, we're reading a King James Bible here, and the King James Bible is calling someone a heretic. So what the King James Bible is saying is if someone doesn't believe the words of the Bible, of this book, they're a heretic. Amen. So how would I know that somebody doesn't, Believe the words of the Bible. I mean, man, I'm going to go through 30 verses. I'm going to spend 45 minutes with somebody, and I'm going to find out that there's just nothing I can do. Man, maybe if I give them that 50th verse, that 60th verse. You know, maybe if I just try a little bit harder, but the Bible's saying, no, you give them one or two. That's it. You give them one or two, and that is the end of it. Because if you give them one or two, the Bible is just giving you clear soul-winning direction right here. It's saying, look... You give them one or two, and if they don't accept one or two, they're subverted. There's, somebody's gotten to them. They, they have something else that they're, they're really, you know, trusting on, and they're, they're, trying to, they're, trying to, they're trying to trick you. They're trying to waste your time. So the Bible's telling you in Titus chapter 3, and verse number 10, it's like, don't argue with heretics. It's saying, don't waste your time. So... Turn to Titus chapter 3. Go back to verse number 9. So I'm going to give you two reasons why we're not going to debate at the door. And look, this is a, this is a, big, um, this is a big kind of roadblock for like new soul winners. Is that you know, they think that, man, I, I, just, I need to know the Bible front to back. I need to have everything memorized. I need to, because I have to go out there and I have to win debates. But you don't have to win debates. Not at all. You need to know a, a clear path through the gospel. Oh, no, look, I think, I think that the more Bible you know, the better soul winner you will be. But to go out and be able to give the gospel to somebody that wants to know the truth, you need to know the clear path through the gospel that we take. You need to know the, the, the different steps that everybody needs to be aware of. And you need to have what? You need to have one or two verses to back up, you know, certain common heresies. That's what you need. To become a soul winner. Why only one or two verses, Pastor? Because that's what the Bible says. Because if you give them three, it's not going to do any, it's not going to help. If they won't believe one or two, they're not going to believe 60. They're just trying to waste your time. So the first reason that we don't debate people, so look, you don't have to win debates. So all you new soul winners, people that are thinking about, you know, soul winning, you don't have to be. You know, this, this debate winner, this, this super, you know, you got every single Bible verse on every single doctrine memorized? Not at all. I started soul winning before um, I had a lot of the, you know, every single one of the verses memorized. I just had them highlighted in my Bible and just started going after it. I mean, it's, it's good to have them memorized, but you want to show the verse to them anyway. Yep. Yep. Show the verse to them anyway. That's the other thing, you know, just make sure... That, I mean, it's a pretty simple process. Like, we, we have the verses, you know, we have the path through the verses. You read a verse, and then you explain the verse. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. You know, make sure that you're explaining the verses. Because, you know, they, these are unsaved people. They don't understand that, you know, things that you think are the simplest things in the Bible, they may have not heard before. So make sure that you are explaining those verses. But look at Titus chapter 3 and verse number 9. So the first reason that we don't debate people is because the Bible says not to. Look at Titus chapter 3 verse number 9. The Bible says right before this heretic, this heretic direction, it says avoid foolish questions. You know what a foolish question is? 
you know, did Jesus ever claim to be God? That's a foolish question. That's a foolish question. Many times I won't, this is just because I have so much experience with people with that question. I won't even open the Bible to people that ask that question. <laughs> you can, okay? I'm not saying don't give people what, but I have never one time heard somebody ask that or make that statement that wants to see it from the Bible. Like, they don't even want you to open the Bible. It's, it's like 100% in my life. And somebody will prove me wrong on that, and that's fine. Okay, but it, the Bible says avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. We're going to get to that last part in just a second. But the Bible is telling us several things to avoid here. Genealogies, we talked about that last week. Okay, but avoid foolish questions. So the problem here becomes what's a foolish question and what's a real question? Because we don't want to be these people that go out soul winning and somebody asks a question and we're like, heretic. <laughs> you know, somebody doesn't get it right away and we're like, you heretic. You know, I mean, we wouldn't say that anyway. But, I mean, the point is, sometimes people just need more clarification on things. And so we need to be able to distinguish the, the real questions to, from the foolish questions. And you say, well, how do we do that? I mean... First of all, like, there's a lot of people that they hear the gospel the first time, and, and like, many people, if they are listening, they will have questions. So I like questions. Don't get me wrong. Questions are good, but real questions, not foolish ones. Okay, so, I mean, the Bible's giving us some, some I mean, here are some common ones. Some common ones are, like, you, you teach eternal security to people, which is a, a new concept to many people, especially Protestants and Catholics. Eternal security is a new concept. And you will get people that are uh, they're just, they're confused by it. It's not like they're not believing what you're saying. They're just saying, like, are you saying that people can just go do whatever they want? That I could just go out and, you know, commit all kinds of sin and, and I'm just going to go to heaven? Well, that's something that will need some more explanation. That's something that you will need to read another verse or two and then explain those verses or two. And then their, their questions should go away. As you talk about how, you know, the adoption works and you give the comparison of, of your child, you know, always being your child. That's a great one, by the way. That's a great analogy that, that the Bible uses that analogy. And, and that's a great one that really clears it up for people. Because people will clear it up for themselves. That's why I like that one so well. Because when you talk to somebody about, well, I have a son. And if he's bad, I'll punish him. I'll spank him. If he grows up to be a wicked kid, God forbid, I'll kick him out of my house. But will we ever stop being my son? I've never one time out of talking to thousands of people, never had a person say, yeah, he's going to stop being your son. They always say, no, he's always your son. No, that's always, you're always going to be his, his father. They answer the question for themselves. And you say, that's exactly how salvation works. And they're like, oh. It clicks. They get it. Those are real questions. Those are good questions. So how do I tell the foolish questions? You know, the, the Jesus not being God one, okay, that's, that's, that's an extreme one, so I can recognize that one. But what, how can I tell if somebody's just not really asking a sincere question? The answer is you show them one or two scriptures. That's the answer. That's what the Bible is telling us here. The Bible is literally giving us a methodology here on how to do this. Brother Jeff had one of these that was just perfect. Uh, I hope he doesn't mind me using it as an example. But we were out soul on Saturday. And he had somebody that was, was telling him that baptism, is, baptism saves you. And coming up to somebody, when you're giving somebody or you're wanting to give somebody the gospel, he hadn't even started giving the gospel. It's just asking what it takes to, to go to heaven. It was just baptism. You must be baptized. And it was just this, just works. I mean, and look, there was a lot of other issues there. And, and you could, you know, that came out later. But basically, you know, Jeff, I mean, what, what did Jeff do? He gave, you know, one or two verses. That's what he did. He gave Acts 16, 31. He's like, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Pretty complicated. But there's no baptism in that statement. Just showing that, you know, and then, you know, you could have given all kinds of other verses. You know, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. I mean, there's no baptism in these verses. For, so for these verses to be true, you must be wrong. But he showed that clearly to her from the Bible. And right away, she said, it, it, it's confusing what she said. Because she doesn't know what Jesus says. She doesn't know what the Bible said. But Jeff literally told, showed her that from the Bible. And she said, no, no, no. I just believe what Jesus said. And I'm like, what? We're like, huh? 
So she doesn't know what Jesus said, but the point is, is that when you clearly show someone the Bible, and they, she, the key to not wasting any more time there was that she, she brushed off the Bible. It did, not, it did not deter her for a second, a millisecond. Showing that verse from the Bible, no, 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 right there, we're, we're done here. Because if you don't believe the Bible, you can't be saved. Why? Because Jesus is the Bible. Jesus is the Word. I'm not going to say it by getting saved, you're going to know everything in the Bible, but if you don't believe the Bible, it's not possible. It's not possible. The Bible literally had no effect. And as soon as you see that through those one or two verses, at this point, you're talking to someone asking foolish questions and saying foolish things. And there's people down the street that want to hear the gospel. Yeah. That's what you need to understand. The devil loves to waste our time. So the Bible's given a very clear methodology there on how to avoid foolish questions. You just give one or two. And look, he just had to give one because like, immediately she completely dismissed the Bible. That's it. That's it. And then like a bunch of other stuff came out and it was weird and you could just tell she, she, there was no weight that the Bible had. It was only things that she had been taught, which is like, this is the danger of false prophets. This is what they create. You know, we, we obviously feel bad for that lady and we wish we could have showed her the truth and we have compassion for that person, but that doesn't mean we're going to stand and give 60 verses and stand there and talk about all the, the, the weird supernatural things that, you know, people want to talk about or experiences that they've had or whatever because we're out there to preach the truth to people and if we waste time on people that are just asking foolish questions that give no weight to the Bible, people aren't going to get saved. We're not going to get to people, right? It's a, we're talking man hours here, folks, and we're out soul winning. I mean, it is a function of people on the ground and the time we spend on people that will get saved, all right? How about this one, contentions? Contentions. This Jesus never claimed to be God, that's a contention. That's somebody that is just trying to be contentious with you. That's why I say, you know, somebody asked me that, I don't even, I don't even, whatever. Because it, first of all, it's so foolish. It is so just proof that they have no idea what the Bible says. I mean, the Bible is one of those books, I've said it before, but it's the only book, it's a proof that it's the Word of God. Because it's, it's the only book that people will claim to know when they've never read a word of it. There's no other book like that. Nobody's going to read, you know, you know, go around to some book club where they're all discussing a tale of two cities and walk into the book club and say, oh yeah, I know everything about this book. Because like, they're going to be found out to be a fool in about three seconds. Nobody would even think about doing that with any other book, but they do it with the Bible all the time. Because they, they, they heard some fool on YouTube or something say it, and they're just repeating it. When every single page of the Bible proves that Jesus is God. Every single page. How about this one? Striving about the law. Striving about the law. These are the people that, you know, they're just like, you can lose your salvation. You must have works. And they just want to strive. And they, they literally just want to debate you. They literally just want to debate you. And here's the thing, folks. Like, man, I could, I could win debates. If you know the Bible, man, could you win the debate? No, you really couldn't. You know why? Because debates are really... Does anyone really win a debate? Have you ever seen like an evolutionist like debate a, a creationist or something like this? And then, like, have you ever seen like the evolutionist just like change his mind after the debate's over and just be like, oh, you know, you are right about that. You could get proved wrong, you know, every single point, and I've seen debates that are exactly that way. And, but it's an exercise in pride. That's what debates are. No one's ever gonna, no one's ever gonna get their mind changed by a comment on YouTube or argument on Facebook or whatever, because these are just debates. They're just strivings about the law, and they're just exercises in pride is, is all they are. And in order to be saved, you literally need to get rid of your pride. That's why people can't let go of their works, because they're prideful. They, they, I got to have some part of this. You got to humble yourself and get rid of your pride, which leads me to the second reason, the second reason that we don't debate people, and that's because it doesn't work. It's unprofitable. It's unprofitable 
And it's vain. It, it, not only, look, not only would it just make jerks of us at the door, you know, we're, we're always trying to be friendly, but it just doesn't work. If arguing with people worked, if you go up to somebody's door and you could just debate them and you could just prove that you know more of the Bible than them, because look, the smallest child in this church knows more Bible than all, the vast majority of people in our population today. There is just no question about it. The, the kids in this church know so much Bible. The teenagers in this church know so much Bible. The teenagers in this church will, will go up and they will, they will school pastors. Because like, these people have no idea. Like, like, we had a couple ladies like chase a pastor away. Like, it just, I mean, not chase them away, but they're just, like, showing them Bible, and they're like, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? He's like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go! You know, some Presbyterian or something. And they, they have no idea what the Bible says today, but here's the thing. They're going to stand there and just debate one or two verses, get out of there. Why? Because debating doesn't work. Because people don't just say, oh, you know what? You're right. You do know way more Bible than I do. This, it just never happens. One or two verses, and that's it. Now, look, you're going to find people that maybe need to get the gospel one or two, three, four times, whatever it is, but those are people that are just thinking about it. Those aren't people that are just striving and contentious and, and argumentative uh, about what the Bible says and what it doesn't say. So it just doesn't work. If it worked, I'd be all for it. If it worked, like, hey, let's, let's go debate every single unsaved person that we find and we just like stick our foot in the door and just not let them leave until we prove that we know the Bible better than them and we will get like 95, 6, 7 percent of people saved if it worked. It doesn't work. That's why the Bible in Titus chapter 3 is giving us this device because you can't make people believe. And that's really, it's really kind of a balanced attitude that you need to have as a soul winner. Because, like, we care about people, right? I mean, don't I, don't I, I, I stand up here and, and when I pray for the, the soul winning ministry, what do I do? I pray for the hearts of the soul winners in our church. I pray for the hearts, because, look, if you go soul winning uh, many, many times and you go soul winning maybe multiple times a week, there, there will be weeks when it, maybe it's 110 degrees outside. There will be times you go out soul winning. There will be weeks you go out soul winning where it kind of seems like, kind of seems like work where it kind of seems monotonous. And that's why I pray for the hearts of the soul winners to always remain soft, because we always want to go out soul winning. We always want to be like, you know, I hope I can talk to somebody today. I hope I can find that person. God, give me that person today that's in this neighborhood that, that, that's seeking the truth. Help me be that person that carries that truth to them and fulfills your promise in Matthew chapter 7 to that person. Lord, just help me. That's the heart that we need to have. But the thing is, we have to keep that heart while you know, 95% of people don't want to hear. And so we have to care about that. We have to care about these people that don't want to hear the truth and that maybe are contentious and striving about the law. We can't lose that caring even though not everyone's going to believe. So it's kind of a, a, kind of a reality that we kind of need to know that the vast majority of people aren't going to believe like you. But we can't let that ruin us. We can't let that harden our hearts. And look, that, that can be a struggle. That can be a struggle, especially if you get some really hard neighborhoods or you get some, you know, some really unreceptive areas. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8. But you can't make people believe. That's why it's by belief. That's why it's by belief, because belief is 100% the individual's responsibility. 100%. It's the only thing that's that way. No one can force anyone to believe anything. People can take your house away. They could, they could take your... Look at everything that was taken from Job. They could take everything away from you. They could take your family. They could take all your property. They could even make you say things. They can even make you recite things that you don't think are true. But they can never make you believe something. Belief is yours. It's your personal responsibility. And that's what we have to remember. When we go out and we offer that truth, we've done our job. We have fulfilled what Jesus Christ wants us to do. 
And if people reject it, they didn't reject us. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. When the people asked for a king, Samuel was all bent out of shape. He was taking it personal. He was upset with the people. And God's telling him, don't be upset. It said, the thing displeased Samuel, verse number 6. And when they said, give us a king to judge us, Samuel was offended by this. Samuel, Samuel, think about this for a second. Samuel was the leader. Samuel, you know, we're talking about the last judge. You know, we had the, we had the, the book of Judges. So, so God, you know, ruled the, the nation of Israel. And then God gave the nation the judges. Samuel was the last judge. He wasn't the last judge because God, didn't, God wanted him to be the last judge. He was the last judge because the people said, we don't want a judge anymore. So we want a king like all these nations around us. We want to be like them. That's why God wanted the nations utterly destroyed. Because he knew that the people would just want to be like all these wicked, heathen nations. Sound familiar? But, so Samuel's offended on many levels. But God is telling him, like, look, you're not really offended on the right level. The thing was displeasing Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. He's like, just do what they want. He says, For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. God's kind of telling Samuel here, kind of get over yourself. It's not really about you judging them. They're rejecting the Lord, Samuel. They're rejecting me. And that's what you have to remember when you're out soul winning and people slam the door in your face. People are rude to you. They're contentious to you. And they want to, look, they want to stop you. They want to harden your heart. They want to they wreck your heart for soul winning for the next person next door that, look, if you've got to knock 200 doors to get to that one, it's worth it. If you've got to knock 300 doors to get to that one person that wants to know the truth, it's worth it. You've got to knock 500 doors. There's times I've gone several months without getting somebody saved. But then you end up getting somebody saved. It's worth it. Why? Because we're talking about somebody's eternity. We're talking about heaven and hell. If I moved to Fresno, or you came to church, you got one person, and your whole life saved, it'd been worth it. But what do we do? We get, God gives us much more fruit than that. But if I move my whole family here, or you move to here, and you came here and started sowing, and in 10 years you got one person saved, it's worth it. It, it's, it's heaven and hell for somebody. So you can't let this harden you, not even a little bit. Shake, I mean, that's, shake the dust completely off your feet. Don't let any of that dust stay on your feet because they're rejecting Jesus, not you. And really, if we, we put that on us, we're kind of putting something on us that's, that's not ours. It's, it's Jesus they're rejecting. They're, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not big enough or important enough, and you're not big enough and important enough to be rejected. Jesus is, though. And that's the main thing. So it's, it's God that's being rejected, not us. The Bible is clear, folks. The doctrine is clear. Some people just aren't, and you know, they, they don't want to or they're not going to believe it. And it's not a rejection of us. So we can't let that harden us even a little bit. Because there's so many people that depend on us. I mean, look, we're going to get way more people than one person saved in Fresno. We're seeing fruit. We're seeing people saved every single time we go out soul winning almost here, most times. So there's fruit out there. We just we need to make sure that we stay soft and, and, and stay with our hearts in the right place and, and kind of get past that rejection of ourselves because it's not our rejection. So there's some soul winning tips for you uh, from Jesus tonight. Again, we're going to be thorough soul winners. Even though Jesus is like, I'm the Messiah, we're going to tell people the whole gospel because that's our job because we're not Jesus. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.